So good to be gathered this morning together. So good to have you joining us online. I am so excited that we were going to wrap up our series of walking together, looking at the life of Peter today. And then like about a week and a half ago, I was just in, like, God just kind of like, hey, you got one more. So we're actually going to end the series next week, but we're going to continue it today. And I, I don't know if you've been on the journey with us or maybe this is your first time, but we've been looking at the life of one of Jesus' closest friends, one of his first followers, this guy named Peter. And it's just so fun to see the story of when Jesus first met this guy, and he's like, hey, Peter, follow me. And Peter's like, what? And he just kind of chases after Jesus with this reckless abandon because he's so excited, and he just is a goof. And Jesus loves him and transforms him into this epic hero of the faith. And so we've been watching this transformation in Peter's life because it gives us hope in our stories today that, hey, if Jesus can do that with him, man, maybe he can do something in my story today. And we saw Peter last week was a totally different Peter, a radically different kind of guy. Like he was stepping up to the plate and he was sharing the message of Jesus. So much so like he was even put in prison for it. And he's like, I don't, I don't care. I want to follow Jesus. And we saw in the story that Christy was sharing last week, if you've missed these teachings, I would just encourage you to go back. They're so encouraging. Peter does something incredible through the, through the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. He heals a man. 5,000 people come to faith in Jesus in one moment. That's pretty phenomenal. And if you go back to the beginning of his story, when Jesus calls Peter, he's like, Peter, you, you were a fisherman. I'm going to make you a fisher of people. Peter experienced that reality because from the beginning, Jesus saw who he could become. Jesus saw Peter for who he really was, and he began to invite him into that in his own story. And it's so fun watching Peter becoming the greatest version of himself. It's almost like he's becoming like this, this ultimate kung fu fighter in his life. And he's just becoming this awesome dude. Okay, I'm a bit of a nerd. No. One of the greatest martial arts films of all times is Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. If you've never seen this movie, I encourage you, unless you don't like violence, and then deal with your own issue, and then watch the movie. But the, the premise of the movie is that there's this epic kung fu tournament that's being put on this mysterious island, and people from all over the world are invited to come by this very mysterious man who's putting on the tournament. And thus, you know, Bruce Lee comes in, but there's this bigger story that's going on. Because it's being put on by this very corrupt man who's like this drug cartel who's ruining people's lives and he's ruined part of Bruce Lee's character's life. And enter the dragon, a.k.a. Mr. Bruce Lee, who unravels the story. And by the end of the movie, he deals with the cartel and hundreds of people are set free. And I, I love that because I think so much of Peter's life is like he's becoming the dragon. He's becoming the greatest version of himself. And Jesus is using him to set people free as he just continues to walk with Jesus and follow after him. And he's growing into the greatest version of himself as he continues to pursue Jesus and his story. And today we're going to see this encounter that he has with, with the Spirit of God that totally blows Peter's mind. Like he, he expands his paradigm of understanding of what God wants to do in his story, in the stories of other people. And it's this awesome story that we have in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 10, as Peter is about to step into the bigger story God has been waiting to invite him into. Sorry, got to get my sleeves ready for this. All right. Here we go. So let's, let's take a look at this. This is Acts chapter 10, and this is what we begin to see taking place in the story. We're told this, that in Caesarea there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. And he gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. And so here, here's what's interesting. That, that this is the story of Peter, but we're seeing that there's another story taking place in this guy, Cornelius. And here's what's fascinating about this story. This is being told by first century Jews who were following Jesus, and they're talking about a man who represented their oppressor. So Cornelius represents Rome, and Rome had stepped in and totally brutalized them as a people. Now here's Cornelius. He's like that guy in the system, and yet he's not living like any of those people. He's living very differently. Like, he's doing his best to figure out what God is like. How do I follow God? How do I find him? And so he's trying to be a good guy. So God's doing something in Cornelius' story. And so one afternoon, about 3 o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. 
Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He's staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. So as soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. And he told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. And so you've got to catch what's going on here. There's the story that God is doing in Peter's life. So, so much of what we think of with life is that what's going on in my story. So now here's Peter's story. And God's about to do what I would call an intersection. He's about to take Peter in his story, and he's doing something in Peter's story. But there's another story going on with Cornelius. And God is about to bring them together in a way that only God could do. Because there's no way a guy like Peter is going to want to go see a guy like Cornelius. Because Cornelius is the guy that kills people like Peter. And God's like, oh, but wait, watch what I'm about to do. And so we see this time and time again that there's always a bigger story going on. And if we will have eyes to see it, Jesus will always lead us into greater things. And so this is what we see going on in the story. So now Cornelius has had this moment, and God's like, hey, I want you to go see this guy Peter. But Peter doesn't know what's happening in the story. Peter doesn't know this is taking place. He's just doing his own thing. And so the next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. If you've ever wondered, God, are you, are you a meat eater? I don't, I'm just, this is the story, right? So <laughs> here we go. So vegetarians, hang in there. It's going to be okay. But this is a weird moment for Peter, right? Like he's like, what is this? What's going on? And so Peter's response is, no, Lord, Peter declared. I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. Because the things that were in this sheet, in this vision that Peter's seeing, are things that he as a good Jewish man would never have eaten because it wasn't kosher. It was against their dietary laws. And so the response is this, but the voice spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could this vision mean? And and I love that this has to happen to him three times. It seems like Peter just needs three times to figure things out. It's just the kind of, how many times did he deny Jesus? Three times. And when Jesus said, Peter, I'm not done with you. I have a a vision for your life. I'm still at work. How many times did Jesus ask him, do you love me? Three times. So I think like Jesus like, I know you, Peter. So we're going to just do this three times so you get the point, right? But Peter's like, what's going on? I'm so confused. So he's perplexed. So just then the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon, Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. And like Peter needs this memo from from the Holy Spirit right now, right? Because when a Roman soldier shows up at your door, that's never a good day. And what the Holy Spirit is saying, Peter, don't worry, I'm at work in this. Now again, if I'm Peter, I'm probably like, yeah, yeah, but what what do you mean you're at work in this? (laughs) Like, because Rome has just come knocking on my door, and that's never a good day. And all he's getting is the memo of the Holy Spirit. It's like, I've got you, Peter. Don't worry. Just do this. Don't you wish God gave you more information sometimes when he's stirring in your story? Like, hey, what's the plan? And so often the plan is like, I've got it. Just go. <laughs> and so that's what's going on here for Peter. And so he's trying to figure this out. Get up. Go with them without hesitation. So Peter went down and said, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? And they said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night, and the next day he went off with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. So Peter's not dumb. He's bringing a little bit of his crew as well. (laughs) He's like, so if this is going to turn into like a Sharks and the Jets kind of musical scenario, like I just want to have my boys with me. (laughs) And so they arrived in Caesarea the following day, and Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Cornelius is kind of excited. Like, God, you're showing up in my story. I don't know what this means, but it's going to be pretty cool, so I'm bringing everyone into this party. 
And so as Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, stand up. I'm a human being just like you. So they talked together and went inside where many others were assembled. And so then Peter told them, you know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this one or to associate with you. (laughs) What a great way to start the conversation. Like, have you ever read that classic Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People? This is not it. Like, if that's your opening line, you people, my people, not friends. I don't even know why I'm here, buddy. Like, but I look like, like, I, like this is Jesus going like, oh, Peter, <laughs> just keep going. But he goes on, he says, but God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Can you remember that weird vision he had? Peter's starting to put the pieces together. Oh, this isn't about food. This is about people. God, what are you doing? So I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me, why have you sent for me? And Cornelius replied, four days ago I was praying in my house about the same time, three o'clock in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. And he told me, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard. Your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Now send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He's staying in the home of a Simon, Simon the Tanner who lives near the seashore. So I sent for you at once, and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. You can just tell how excited this guy is, right? And here's the thing. Did God give Peter a message yet? Like, no, he's just like, Peter, here's some food. Eat it. What? Peter, here's some men that you're going to be scared of. Go with them. What? Like, this is all Peter knows. And so Peter's like, he's putting the dots together. He's like, oh. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. And Peter suddenly realized, oh, I do have a message. It's the message that Jesus gave us to tell everyone. And I'm starting to realize when he said it's for everyone, oh, it's for everyone. And so this is the message of good news for the people of Israel That there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. And you got to realize how huge of a statement that is for Peter to say to a Roman officer. Because in their day, there was only one Lord, and his name was Caesar. And now here's Peter saying, yeah, that guy Jesus, he's the Lord. This is not the Peter who ran away in the night. This is the Peter who's empowered by the Spirit of God, who has no fear in proclaiming the message of Jesus to people, even when it's one of those people. And he's like, he is Lord of all. And you know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we apostles were witnesses of all he did throughout Judea and in Jerusalem. And they put him to death by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him to life on the third day. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to us whom God had chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him after he he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. He is the one all the prophets testified testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Like, Peter's just telling them the good news about Jesus. But you know how when, like, somebody who has the microphone talks too long? Some of you are like, "Uh (laughs) uh-huh. And you just get this, like, Peter's just getting ready to wind up this long sermon, and God's like, okay, Peter, sweet, you did your part. Now watch what I'm going to do. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. It's almost like, like God's like, all right, Peter, just shut up and let me do my thing now. And the Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles, on those people. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. And then Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? And so he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And afterwards, Cornelius asked them to stay with them for several days. And I, and I love what we're seeing here in this moment because we're starting to see a paradigm where God's got a view of life that's so much bigger than ours. And I think what we need to begin to realize is that there is always a bigger story going on. There's always a bigger story taking place. 
there's always something bigger going on than just what God is doing in our own lives and in our own stories. He's at work in this world, and Peter could have easily missed this moment if he hadn't been walking with Jesus, if he hadn't been leaning in and letting Jesus speak into his life. And see, even though there's always a bigger story going on, I think that at times it's really easy to get caught up in just our own stories. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know anyone who gets caught up in their own stories? Yeah, they're sitting next to you, right? (laughs) I mean, this is easy, isn't it? To get stuck in our own circles and miss the reality that there are other circles where God is up to something, where God is on the move, and we can totally miss the bigger story if we only focus on our own stories. And see, and I think that's just something that happens pretty easily. Like, we, we all have circles that we exist in that we can focus on. And there's nothing wrong with living in our own circles, but I think we just have to be mindful of the fact that there's something bigger than just our circle, that we have to be aware that God's doing something in this world and the people, in the lives of the people all around us. And if we will have eyes to see and ears to hear, Maybe we'll get to be a part of the bigger story. But sometimes we just get caught up in our own circles. Uh, I, I think that there's maybe like, I just described three circles that are fairly common that we all experience. And there's nothing wrong with these circles, but I think we just have to be careful that we don't get stuck in these circles. So I, let's just talk about some of those common circles that I think we all experience. So here's what I'd say is maybe one of the first circles that we all experience. And I would just call it the circle of self or the circle of myself. That's just because I, I exist it as a localized being. Like, I can't exist in your mind because I don't live in your mind. I live in my mind. That's just the reality of how we all exist. And this is the smallest circle. Do you know why? Because only you are in it. <laughs> or only I am in my own circle. And it's very easy to get stuck in the circle. If you have teenagers, you know what I'm talking about. It's fascinating to watch my oldest daughter. She's got a heart of gold, but I'm like, oh, you're going through that, that terrifying thing called adolescence where the whole world revolves around you. I remember that stage too. Some of us are still in that stage, and we're very, very old. <laughs> and we can all get obsessed with the circle. And oftentimes, we get obsessed with the circle with the best of intentions. Right? So you're, you've got some self-work to do. Anyone have self-work to do here? Yeah. And so with the best of intentions, we begin to do that self-work, but we get self-obsessed with ourselves in that self-work. And so in the name of self-care, self-help, self-spirituality, we just spend an exorbitant amount of time and energy on ourselves. (laughs) Do do you know that the self-help industry on average is an $11 billion a year industry? That's insane. What if we could just take half of that and put it to our schools or something? Like, we would solve so many of the problems for our youth. But no, i got to work on myself. And there's there's something really important about that. But at the same time, we can get stuck in that place. And the reason that we get stuck here is because we can make self-care, self-help, self-spirituality the end instead of the means to an end. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, how many of you know that person that just loves going to the gym? Like, just like they're the, they're the gym rat? And you're like, hey, so why do you like going to the gym? So I can get good at going to the gym. I, like, I thought the reason to go to the gym was to get healthy so you could enjoy life. You're like, no, I just like going to that mirror in the gym and just, yeah. That's what this becomes like. When we think that the goal of self-help, self-care, self-spirituality is myself. That somehow the end is me. And it's like, no, no, the goal of of getting healthy or healthier is so that you can ultimately live a life that benefits other people. And when we forget that, we get stuck in the smallest of circles thinking this is the only circle that exists. But there's another circle that starts to widen up. It gets a little bit bigger. This is the circle of my people. Now, this circle is a little bit bigger because... There are more people in it. You finally have allowed other people into the circle. But it's usually not other people. It's usually only those people that you like. Like, like rarely do you have those people in this circle. How many of you know who those people are for you? Yeah, don't point, but you know them, right? And those are the ones who are too different than us. Those are the ones that 
don't fit in our circle. Because what we like to do is to fill this circle with people who are like us, with people who agree with us, with people who think we are always right all of the time, right? Because I love living in that circle. It just feels safe. The problem with that is that we forget that there are other people in the world who are not like us. Okay, one of the reasons why we are in serious trouble as a country is because of this. We are so divided because there's me and mine and you and yours. Can, can I just, can I be political for a little bit? Can you give me permission? How many of you who would identify as Democrats have Republican friends? That's awesome. Good on you. How many of you who would identify as Republicans have Democratic friends? Yeah. Why can't we be friends? Because you think this and you believe that and you do this. It's like, what if we started to be humans first who just have political leanings instead of beating each other up over our bumper stickers? But see, the world can't wrap their mind around that. That's where like, like somebody says, hey, Joel, what's your political view? United we stand, divided we fall. That's my political view. So should I be a Democrat or a Republican? Follow Jesus. Be a Democrat who follows Jesus and be a Republican who follows Jesus and play nice. How awesome would that be? But the challenge is we have a hard time with this because we only like to live in the circle and it's a small circle, isn't it? Now some of us will have a bigger circle. We go beyond this. And this is what I call the circle of my projects. And so this one begins to get a bit bigger because we're willing to include people who are different than us, who are not like us. But one of the challenges that we do is we begin to think of the, the, those other people that are out there as a project. And so I'll be your friend because my hope is to convince you to come around to my way of thinking. Because you're my project. And obviously you don't see life correctly and my job is to make sure you do. So I'll be your friend in the hopes that you come around but what happens is that we make the mistake of just, if I can't think I convince you, then I'm going to drop you as a friend. That's the worship team. They're not leaving because they're upset. They're just getting ready. <laughs> Somebody's like, he just dropped some heat and people are walking out of the room. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I'm a project they're giving up on. That's just what happened right there. But we do that, right? The mistake here is thinking that the goal of relationship is conversion instead of influence. Let me say that again. The mistake of the circle is that we think the goal of relationship is conversion instead of influence. See, the greatest gift that you can give to someone who is totally different than you is the gift of friendship. Because it's through your friendship that you can actually begin to have influence in their story. And one of the greatest things that we can do as followers of Jesus is share the gift of Jesus. But here's the deal. Our faith is not a faith that is imposed on others. Our faith is meant to be a faith that's in invitational and attractional because they see something going on in our story. And one of the greatest gifts that we can give to people is to seek to be a genuine friend to them even if they never, quote unquote, come around. Because sometimes what somebody needs to see is the reality of who Jesus is in your friendship to them, no matter what. But that's hard, isn't it? It's a challenging thing. And one of the things I think has been the most freeing to me to realize that with my own family and my own friends who are different than me is to realize that it's not my job to change them. It's my job to walk with them and to be a good friend, a good, a good sibling, whatever that is, and trust that that the results of my influence are not my department. That's God's department. And God, I'm just going to come and be the person you've called me to be and trust that you're doing something in their story and see what happens over time. And I love this because one of the greatest gifts we can give another person is to see the reality of Jesus in us to them with the hope that we can have influence, that they could maybe discover the same thing we found. So like Christy said earlier, we're all about Jesus here because we believe Jesus is the hope of the world, but I can't shove that hope in someone's face and say, isn't it awesome? I can just simply say, I can tell you the story he's doing in me. And I hope for you that you could have the same story someday. And we let that live out naturally in our relationships. But here's some of the circles that we have, right? 
Does that kind of resonate? Do you, do you sense this? Do you see that? Am I just making this up? Or you're like, yeah, no, I can see that, yeah. And yet I think what we have to realize is that whatever the scopes, scope of our circles may be, there's always a bigger story going on. That God's circle is a little bit bigger than ours. God's always up to something so much bigger than whatever might just be happening in our own circle. Because this very famous line that John writes, one of Jesus' followers, speaks to this. John 3, 16 and 17. For this is how God loved, what? Who? The world. I know, that sounds pretty big. (laughs) This is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that who? Everyone. Everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. See, what God, God's heart is for everyone. Now, that doesn't mean everyone's going to buy it. It doesn't mean everyone's going to believe it. God will never force his love on anyone. He's always inviting people to, into it to experience it. But if somebody doesn't want to be with God, God's not going to force them to be with him. But his invitation is for everyone. So much so that he sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. And see, I think this is what we need to begin to realize is that whatever the scope of our circles is, God's circle is so much bigger because God's circle is the world and he wants to wrap his arms around everyone and he's inviting them to come in and experience the reality of that love. And there's always a bigger story going on than just whatever God is doing in our own stories. This is what Peter began to realize. Oh, Jesus, when you said go and make disciples of the world, you actually meant the world, not just my little Jewish corner. And it's, it's, the, it's just the story that God's doing if we will have eyes to see it and ears to hear it, that God is doing something in another person's life. And I'm telling you, I've seen this and I've experienced this time and time again in my own journey as I've watched what God has done. Let me tell you a story of my friend Aaron. Aaron was the guy, that good friend of ours that we met in L.A. And we bumped into him and his family at the mall, and we recognized that we were all at the same church, and so we just got to talk to him. But let me tell you, this isn't really a story about Aaron. This is actually a story about Brian. Just hang with me. So Aaron and his wife, Cindy, and their family, they moved to California from Florida, and they were trying to find a place to live, and they found a house to rent in the city of Simi Valley where we were all living, and they just wound up moving next to Brian and his wife, Allison, and their family. Small world, because Allison also went to the church where we all went to. But not Brian. Brian hated church. And the reason Brian hated church is because it was full of hypocrites. No argument, Brian. I mean, the world's kind of full of hypocrites, but yes, the church is also full of hypocrites, so no argument. I get it. But man, Brian hated, hated church. And Allison was just always praying for him. And so we just formed this friendship with them. And then Aaron and myself and some of the other guys, that we we would just get together like every week or so, and we would just have a poker night in his garage. And one day, Brian is walking outside, and he sees the garage open, and he sees a bunch of guys playing poker, and he sticks his head, and he's like, hey, what are you guys doing? And we're like, if you got 20 bucks, you're in, man, because we want your money, right? So Brian, Brian comes in and starts to play poker with us. And then after a couple of nights, he's like, hey, my place is a better place, Aaron, sorry, but my place is better. Can I host it? And we're like, sure. So we just start playing poker at Brian's house, just a bunch of friends hanging out. One day, Brian's talking to Allison, and he's like, I really like these guys. Like, they, like, I've never had friends like this before. They're great. And Allison's like, yeah, a couple of them are pastors at my church. It's pretty cool. And Brian's like, wait, what? I've been playing poker with pastors this whole time? He's like, but I don't like those guys, but I like these guys. I don't know what to do. I'm just like, yeah, Brian, we're just, we're just, let's be friends. One day, Aaron and I are hanging out, and, and Aaron really has a heart for Brian. Because he's like, this is literally my neighbor. Like, Jesus said, love my neighbor. This is literally my neighbor. And we were just chatting, and Aaron was just saying, but Joel, I don't know what to do. Because Aaron's like the, the quintessential surfer dude, and Brian was like the, the chopper guy. So even though they're both white guys, like, white people are very different still, right? <laughs> and, and Aaron's just like, I don't, I don't, I just, I, there's just not any natural connection. I don't know what to do. And, and it was really cool, like, about a week before, Brian had bought a mountain bike to give to Aaron, because Brian was into mountain biking. And as Aaron and I were just talking, I was just like, Aaron, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, I can't find, the, like, the magic verse that you read over his life and everything changes. All right, give you a mountain bike. Maybe go mountain bike riding with him sometime. I said, all right. A week later, Aaron calls me, and he's like, bro, you were never going to believe what happened. And I'm like, what? He's like, I went mountain biking with Brian. 
and we're up in the, the, the hills, just overlooking the vista, and the sun is setting, and he breaks down crying with me. And I'm like, and Aaron's just like, what, Brian, what's going on? And he's just like, dude, I don't know what to do with my family. I just like, I feel like, like life is so small. And, and Aaron's like, I've been there. I've wrestled with dark stuff in my story. And all I can tell you is the thing that changed for me was when I met Jesus. Brian, you want to come to church with me? So Aaron's calling me middle of the week. He's like, Brian's coming to church on Sunday. Like, what are we talking about? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not teaching. Like, Mike, our lead pastor's teaching. Like, I, like, but let's not worry. Let's just the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit, and let's just see what happens. So Brian comes to church with his family for the first time. Guess what we're teaching about that Sunday? Why God doesn't like it when we're hypocrites. It's just like, God, God what are you doing? And it's just like, like Brian's like, God, God thinks the way I think about this too. And Brian just kept taking steps. Until we as a group of friends had the privilege of baptizing him and inviting him into our small group. I would love to tell you, here's the five-step plan. I couldn't map that out. All I know is that there was a bigger story going on. And we as a group of friends were just willing to have ears to hear it if we could and to see what God was doing in Brian's story. Do you realize That God is not only at work in your life, he's at work in the lives of the people around you. And if we're willing to walk with Jesus and pursue Jesus, we may begin to see that we get to be a part of someone else's story. Let me just ask you a few questions, three questions, to help us think about this. The fact that there's a bigger story going on and how maybe we can step into it. First question is this. Who are you including in your circles? I'm not answering that for you. You just got to chew on that. Who are you including in your, cir- in your circles? Who are you eating with? Who are you sitting down with? Who do you hang out with at the office or the job site? Second question. Who are you investing your life in? Not because they're a project, but because they are a person who God loves. Third question, who are you inviting to come and see? Like when God creates those moments for you with a friend, so many times we're like, I can't talk about church, I can't talk about Jesus, it's going to get awkward. Can we just get over that and just be willing to trust that maybe God's doing something in their story and when God opens up a moment, let's just be a little brave. Let's just have a little bit of courage and say, hey, all I can tell you is he's doing a number on me and it's really good, there might be something there for you. Why don't you just come and see and let God do what only God can do in another person's story. See, Peter's life flowed beyond just his circle and he had influence in Cornelius' life and Cornelius' family and Cornelius' circle because he was walking with Jesus and he was letting Jesus lead him. Peter just went out to pray, and God showed up one day because Peter was pursuing Jesus. He was walking with Jesus, and Jesus woke him up to the bigger story. Peter, I'm about to send in the dragon. It's you. Get ready. Can we be a church that wakes up to the bigger story that's going on all around us? Can we be a church that's willing to say, maybe God's doing something in someone else's story, and I get to be a part of it? I'm telling you, if we begin to live in that way towards other people, this room will not be big enough for the people that will want to experience the hope we've found. But we've got to make that choice in our own stories. God's circle is big. And he invites us to be a part of the story he's doing in this world. If we will have eyes to see and ears to hear. And so God, thank you. Thank you that for so many of us here today, we are experiencing the reality of the hope of you in our story. But would we know that it's not just for us? You invite everyone into that same hope. And so would you awaken us to that reality? 
Would we get beyond the limitations of the circles as we see them and know that you are on the move? And so give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see that you are on the move. Amen.